in all seriousness, just in terms of physical exercise and the benefits uh, that it can give uh, everyone. Um, but to talk from his perspective, um, I'd like to welcome to the stage the ultra runner, Evan Smith. Hello there. So, first of all, thank you very much for staying for my talk. I know it's half past two somewhere, and obviously it's the weekend, so I imagine everyone's going to go away for the weekend somewhere. Um, second of all, just want to say a massive thank you to Nadine Honeybourne and Autistic Minds for allowing me to come to speak to you today. This is my first ever speaking gig, so no pressure, right? Um, so, just a bit of an introduction. So, my name's Evan Smith, and as you... No, I'm, I am the ultra runner. Uh, this talk is called Life From My Eyes, and what you're going to learn from this talk is it's mostly a perspective of life through my eyes. So you're going to be learning of, uh, in particular, how autism affects me and how running has helped me cope, helped me cope with all my issues. So let's get right to it. Oh, do we have a clip? It's not working. You are? Oh, is it? <laughs> can I just, is, is it, can I, can someone run it over, please? <laughs> there we are, now it's working. Hey, we sorted. So before we do, before we actually get on to the main meat and potatoes of this talk, you're going to learn a bit more about me in terms of uh, how I was raised and in particular my education background. I'll also be discussing a bit more about my autism. And there are two stories which I'm going to be sharing with you today, both from the autistic point of view and, of course, the running point of view. And I will be sharing a little bit more about how running has helped me cope and, of course, in particular, the lessons that I've learned along the way. So, let's get right to it. To understand how I've got to this point in my time, let's take a trip back into my life. I was born in 1996, a proud 90s July kid. And by the age of four, alarm bells are starting to go off. I was hitting all these other milestones in my life, but there is one that I haven't hit yet. I wasn't speaking. I used to point and grunt. And when visitors come over, I would get up, sit in that corner over there, and I wouldn't even move. Not even a peep. Until the visitors would go. I had little friends. I've already had two friends when I was in nursery. And I was not a massive fan of noise and crowds. In fact, I would even have a meltdown when I get my hair cut. I still have anxiety now to this day. By the age of four, oh, I was then sent to Bay Bargain Primary School and Kutsar Comprehensive School. Both of these schools have speech and language units, speech and language units. And up until the age of 16, I entered its mainstream with the MPTC group, and I studied IT for the three years that I was there. My teachers back then at Kutsar weren't a fan of that. They thought it was going to be too hard. In fact, they still th thought that back then it would be too hard for me to do history and IT that were both mainstream. I came out of that with a C in history and the merit in IT, which is equivalent to a C. But then 2015 happened, and I decided to attend university, studying computer games development, so all your PS4s, your Xbox games, your Nintendo Switches. I studied how to develop them. For the four years I was there, I was at Swansea Metropolitan, or now known as the University of Wales Trinity St. David. I took a year to find work. That didn't go well either. So I made the decision then to go back to full-time education, this time to a different place. 
I studied advanced computer science at Cardiff University. And I was there for two years. Now, the idea was for me to get experience there because there's a placement program. And then the pandemic happened. And, yeah, there was no opportunities there. So why am I telling you all of this? From a kid who couldn't speak at the age of four to now achieving a master's by the age of 27, there's one lesson I can give to you today that has been echoed around quite a lot. Autism doesn't define you, but you could define it. Let's have a chat about my autism in particular. I was diagnosed when I was nine, so yes, very, very late on. And I still often recall the struggles that my mother had to go through to get that diagnosis, and in particular, my dad. And I attended a speech, speech and language unit for close up to 12 years, since the age of four, until I was 16. I've had the opportunity to meet three speech therapists. One in primary school, two in, two in comprehensive school. The recent one that I've had invited me to attend a youth club known as the Youth Youth Troop. Bless you. And the reason why I was invited there is because of what I've been through. By having me there, I was able to help her out as a kind of a way of repaying her for all the years that she was with me for. Kim Louise Jenkins, her name was. Brilliant woman. And I was there until 2015, just before I started going to university. Now, the youth club is for people between the age of 11 and 16 who actually have the same challenges that I have, speech and language. The pinnacle moment, I was told at the age of 16, just after my GCSEs and going into college. Now, I still remember there was a bit of a fight over this. Not so much a fight, but a conversation going. And one question that was going to pop up just before I left, who's going to tell him? When should we tell him? Now, the teachers wanted to tell me just before my GCSEs. That stuff I found out much later on. My mother challenged this. I basically said, tell him after GCSEs. And there's two reasons for that. One, doing your GCSEs at that age is an important time. You're making decisions of where to go in life. I was up to my neck in stress and anxiety. The second part reason, I, wasn't, I didn't take it well. I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't even know what it is. Lack of education. Looking back on it now, that was actually the right call. Had I been told this, my GCSEs would have gone a lot more rougher. So, what was I like as a kid growing up? I was a big warrior. I worried about all the small things that soon inflated to the big things. I was very anxious. I was very anxious of the work I do and anxious of what I needed to do. Did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? And I was also a perfectionist. To some extent, it's actually a bit of a good thing. But it's how you control it. And I didn't control it back then. And being a perfectionist, I have an attention to detail. But sometimes I can just do it a little bit too much. There's a point where you have to basically pull yourself back and say, that's enough. <coughs> and of course, I was very misunderstood. The 90s was a little different back then. Society was a little different back then. But fast forward 20 years now, we've come a long way in terms of awareness. Multiple charities, there's a little bit more to some awareness. 
That's what it was back then. To put all this into perspective, let me tell you one story. The title of this is called Crime Me Steep, and you'll find out just a minute as to why. The first time I attended university, everything was brand new to me. I was living in Mount Pleasant, just above from the police station on the Kingsway in Swansea. I lived with new people there, and I didn't trust them initially. But over time, as I got to know them a bit more, I started to view them as really good people. But my life of university back then was very stressful. I didn't have the right technical support back then that I later on achieved in the third year and then the, extra, the repeat year of my uni life. It was not fun. So while others on Wednesday night would be partying with booze, the vodkas, the whiskies, the tequilas, I would be crying to sleep. Hence the title. The stress was getting too much. I would have to sometimes have meltdowns and I'd be crying to my sleep. Like there's no tomorrow. So what did I do to cope with it? What did I do to manage it? Well, short answer. I didn't. I wasn't exercising like I am now. And exercising is brilliant because in our minds, I often view force as a little, a little ball, like a knitting ball. All of these strings, all these thoughts. And it was so tangled that I couldn't even process. I couldn't even make correct decisions. I couldn't even make really better judgments. I was also eating unhealthy. McDonald's, drinking loads of coffee, fueled the anxiety even more. I barely went anywhere, so I didn't go to the student nights much, because the next morning, I got to get up for a lecture. I lived in a dark room for most of my time. I was constantly working on deadlines 24-7. I didn't drink Red Bull, although one story I've heard was one student drank Red Bull to keep him going. That kid actually ended up in hospital a few weeks later. He's doing all right now. But it pays to show that I need to get a grip. So this happened for a few months, for the first few months of the first semester, from September, or October rather, to January. But then something happened. I set myself a goal to do the Swansea Half Marathon in 2016. Take a place in June, it's 13.1 miles, out to Oystermouth in Mumbles and back. To do that, to prepare for it, I exercise more regularly now. So, Wednesday nights, student nights, not for me. Gym nights, running down to Oyster Mouth in the dark on my own and back, those were my Wednesday nights. I was eating more healthier. I wasn't eating so much rubbish. But my coffee stayed a little bit under, normally around two a day. And knowing I, tr I can trust my flatmates, I opened up a bit more. One of them, however, was smart enough to court that I was autistic really early on. The other guys didn't. So, what have I learned from this? By having a goal, I was able to put my mind to something. Uni work is just part of the nine to five basis that I've had. But when I, as soon as my day is done, I would go training. And soon enough, all of these thoughts in my head, this little massive ball that I talked about, they became flat. And that allowed me to think clearer. It allowed me to process things better. It allowed me to sleep better. Which is a perfect segue into becoming the ultra runner that I am now. I started running in 2015, just before uni, but I didn't take it up as much in the first semester. But in 2016, I joined the Patalbot Harriers. 
just before the Cardiff Half Marathon, I decided to go, at the behest of my dad to take up training with him. The Harriers has been here for over a hundred years and we're the only club in Wales to have our own clubhouse. Before, it used to be the small little shack, but now it's even better. I started doing half marathons and then I decided to do two marathons. And right around the time of 2019, I tried to apply for the London Marathon, which in the running community, the ballast system is a joke. It's a broken system. Now, one person I know has tried seven times to get in. He failed those seven times. But yet, a celebrity can just wander through. And all of us are just looking like, why is this ballast system not fair? It isn't, but the organizers are still making a lot more money. So I decided this question. What is beyond the marathon? Can we go even further than London? The answer is, oh yes, we can. Ultra running has been around since the 50s, but it grew popular or started to take off a little bit more into a niche scene in the 70s. The true definition of ultra running, you're running more than 26.2 miles into the 32 miles all the way up to the 100 miles. I started doing this on my own. Well, I was training for most of the pandemic years during 2020 and decided there's no events. Let's do our own. I did 35 miles off my own back all around my backyard with 5,000 feet of climbing. Not bad for our first ultra run. But then I decided to continue a bit more. I started doing 50 miles in the Galwa in 2021. I even was crazy enough to do 100K in the Bracken Beacons, which is 64 miles. And just recently, <laughs> I did 100 miles from Rossilli to Cardiff Bay, just outside the Norwegian church down there. Blowing minds now, haven't I? But how did it help? It allowed me to relieve my anxiety. I was a very anxious kid growing up. Not so much now. I still have my moments here and there. But it allowed me to connect with several people. Us runners, we all share one goal. To get to whatever destination we are. We train together. We sometimes open up to each other. We even have pints together. That's my social life. I'm still with the Tobit Harriers, still. And, well, in the next three years, I'll be there for ten years. That's how I love a dream that. Now, here's one story that's going to shock you a little bit. The 100 miles has been here since the 70s. It started off with the Western States over in America. But for me, it started off with this. The Dragon 100, run by Run Rock Crawl, is exactly that. 100 miles from, the, from Worms Head, Rossilli, through the Gower, into the Vale of Glamorgan, and into Cardiff Bay. The deadline, you've got to do it in less than 36 hours. Running more than five hours to some is a hell of achievement. But running 24, that's even more impressive. Why did I do this? I wanted the challenge. Now, challenges are meant to stretch us thin. They're meant to help us grow. They're meant for us to do better. And it was a step towards something bigger, which I'll share a little later on before the end of this talk. <laughs> a lot of my social life was pretty much non-existent. I would spend, I could say, six to seven hours on the trail on Saturday, Saturday morning. Maximum distance, 35 miles. And I would get up to do the same the next morning, 
running 20. So in particular, I will probably spend about close to about 12 to 15 hours exercising, going for the trails, for the villages, and all to the coastal path. That was my weekend. But of course, if you set yourself a challenge, you give it 110%. But in the build-up to this, I was exposed. I spent eight months from December all the way up until Jan uh, July. I would even train on Christmas morning, running 13 miles with 2,000 feet all around my backyard at 7 o'clock in the morning. But the week or two before, my emotions were running really, really high. Now, I was an emotional kid. I didn't handle emotions very well. But with an unprecedented level such as that, I locked up. I couldn't even express it. I sometimes come across as rude, even when I don't want to. I didn't have a coping mechanism back then. I do now, which I'll share in a minute, but not back then. A friend of mine, a great friend of mine, Rachel Monks, she gave me one good piece of advice. Don't shut anyone out. It's tough to open up, but as long as you've got the right people around you to open up to, it's, it's a little bit easier for them to understand. I didn't see a lot of people back then. It wasn't great, right? And there was a couple of things I've learned in this particular instance. The coping mechanism, and the one I developed, is this. This is my ultra journal. This is what I use to write down all of my thoughts for the races and process them. It allows me to get all of the stuff in my head onto a piece of paper. I got two more journals, one for education, which I was lucky enough to got at an event just early, well, probably late last year. But the third one is a private one. That is my self-growth journal. Of all the things I've encountered, maybe it's rejections, maybe it was something else, grief, loss, write it down in one journal. When you write things down, for me personally, it allows me to hammer all the stuff out of my head and onto a piece of paper, and allows me to think better, and it allows me to learn from it. We all have bad times in life, right? But it's how we respond to it that matters. I finished 100 miles in 16th place overall, 27 hours, 48 minutes. From 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I would run throughout the night, alone in Avon Forest, which is like the largest Europe, woods in Europe. And literally come into the Norwegian church at 5 p.m. is the most important currency, because you can never get that back. By having these people giving them instructions of what to do when I come in, it allows them to at least bring it out the best in support. Beth and Thomas and Zoe Etman were in the, my darkest hours. At five o'clock in the morning, just outside Treco Bay, I literally was not eating enough. I was losing weight at a very rapid pace. And I was getting close to calling it quits. But I knew one thing, this will pass. The reason why I did this and the reason why I decided to do this was because of one man. On the 22nd of December last year, I lost my granddad three days before Christmas. There were two words that I said to him before he passed. Honour him. And those words rang true in my mind for those 27 hours. Now, 
my, my team, including my parents, helped me support me throughout the night and into the day. Three of those people weren't in the, that sort of picture. But it blew my mind for them to all come out and to see me finish. It was a huge surprise. I was expecting them to go out and support the Swansea Ironman. But no, they actually came to see me. And I hammered home the thing that I always preach. Have a good, tight, small circle around you. By having a good, sm small circle of people around you, who know exactly who, uh, who you are and what you want to achieve and will support you to achieve that, I consider that rich in social life. And what was my reward? A small voucher for a tiny rebel camp. I would have preferred a glass of whiskey. That's cheap, that is. So, what's next? I'm in Dorset in April next year doing another crazy distance. 84 miles, with 12,000 feet of climbing. But there is one small problem. I got 24 hours to finish it in. Now, 50% of those startups don't even make it to the finish line. But I always believe in one thing. If you don't put yourself through difficult challenges, you're not going to grow. Every year, I always do something difficult. Why? Because it allows me to become better, but bring the best version of me. But the dream goal which I mentioned early on in the presentation is something called UTMB. Some of us entrepreneurs know this very well. But for those who don't, let me just quickly run this down. Taking place in Chamonix in France, around late August to September, all the great ultra runners come together for one massive week of racing. It's 100 miles, 33,000 feet of climbing. Just as equivalent as climbing Mount Everest. And they go for the French, the Italian, and the Swiss Alps. That is my dream goal. I've, been, I've watched it on YouTube since 2019, and I told myself, this is it. This is where we want to be. And to this day, I'm still pre preparing myself to do it. And hopefully I'll be there in the next three years. We'll see. Hope it's not as bad as London. So, before we wrap up, let's, go, let's have a quick recap of what I've learned that you can take on board with you today. Half a copper mechanism. Now, my copper me mechanism is journaling. Yours might be different. It could be meditation. It could be yoga. <coughs> By having the copper mechanism, you can help process your emotions and what you learn from it and keep in control. Have a strong, tight circle. Now, it's okay to be picky. It's okay to be selective because you want the best people around you. You don't want people who drain you. You don't want people who are not supportive. Choose your people carefully. There's one point I've learned, and it's called 50 points from the 80-year-old man. One of them is choose your life mates carefully. With this one decision, comes 90% happiness or misery. Choose carefully. Control what you can. We've been in situations where there are things out of our control and we're constantly stressed about them. Control only what you can and put your energies into those things that you can control. By doing that, you will be much better and less anxious. But ask yourself this question, can I control this? If it's people's behavior or something else, let it go. It's okay to let go, but don't put your energy into those things that you can't control. 
find a goal to challenge you. Challenges are meant to stretch us thin. It doesn't have to be running. It does have to be running 100 miles. But find something to challenge you. Bring out the best in you. And last but not least, have a healthy regime. Eat healthy, none of that McDonald's, none of that Starbucks, and none of that Burger King or Popeyes. Eat healthy, plenty of chicken, and so forth. Unless you're vegan. But the biggest thing I've learned is this. Autism doesn't define you. But you could define it. So, now you've seen life through my eyes. Now it's time for us to see life through yours. I hope you find what I have just shown you interesting. And I hope that you can draw on some inspiration and bring out the best in you. Thank you very much.